Every one of us grew up watching good Disney cartoons on TV or in movie theaters. But not many of us know that Walt Disney himself grew up in poverty and challenging child labor, and once he was even homeless. How he managed to found the most significant media brand and create a whole universe of characters about this in today's video. Disney was born December 5, in 1901, in Chicago's Hermosa neighborhood. His father, Elias, was a farmer and businessman, and his mother, Flora, was a teacher. His father was trying so hard to start up a successful enterprise, but failed over and over again. So to make a living, he became a carpenter. When Disney was four, the family moved to a farm in Missouri, where his uncle Robert had just purchased land. Their family was pretty big. Walt had three older brothers and one little sister. Because it was pretty hard to meet the aunts with such a big family, their father was becoming more aggressive towards his children. I guess the pressure was so bad that the two eldest brothers ran away from home. Elias, their father, got sick with phenomia. But the farm had to be carried on and taken care of. So Roy, the third son, had to work on a farm, which was a little difficult for a 16-year-old and almost unbearable. So the Disney family eventually sold the farm and moved to Kansas City. Elias bought a newspaper business in Kansas City and forced two brothers, Walt and Roy, to make all deliveries. You know how it is with newspapers. They have to be delivered before dawn. So the brothers had to wake up at 4.30 a.m. and repeat the round for the evening newspaper after school. Walt wasn't earning much money for this job, so he took up other opportunities, delivering drugstore prescriptions and sweeping floors. The schedule was exhausting and Disney often received poor grades after falling asleep in class, but he continued to work like this for more than six years. There wasn't much entertainment for kids at that time, but I mean, with all the stress at home, with the shortage of money, dad being a little aggressive, exhausting jobs, and two brothers away, no wonder that Walt started to look for anything to distract him with. He used to take his father's newspaper and copy cartoons and other illustrations from it. And when his sister got sick, he drew her a little series of figures that appeared to move when the papers were flipped. He was reading books about success and adventure, drawing cartoon figures for them, and dreaming of what kind of life they had. Disney attended the Benton Grammar School, where he met fellow student Walter Pfeiffer, who came from a family of theater fans and introduced him to the world of vaudeville and motion pictures. Before long, Disney was spending more time at the Pfeiffer's house than at home, watching musical and magic acts and acrobatic and comedy routines. They also started to go to theaters, and it was a secret from Walt's father because Elliot thought that entertainment was a waste of time. While Walt had his little secret life of his own, his brother Roy was at home, dealing with cold and violent tendencies from their father. He ran away too, just like two other brothers earlier. I personally cannot imagine how is it for parents to have two children out of five living with them and three being somewhere else in the world. Okay, so now, Walt, the eldest son in the family, and being just 10 years old, had to work more and help his father not just with business, but also repairing their house. His dad was a low-tempered person, and whenever Walt made a mistake, he would strike him with whatever was nearby. For instance, once it was a hammer, and another time it was a wooden board. Crazy, right? A little while later, when Walt was delivering newspapers early in the winter morning, he kicked a piece of ice and felt pain. A horseshoe nail pierced through his boot and jumped into his toe. He spent two weeks in the hospital, resting not only from his injury, but also from home, his dad, and his jobs. 14-year-old Walt was thinking a lot about his future, that he wasn't very good at school, so probably he couldn't become a doctor or lawyer, and there was no money for college anyway. The drawing was the only thing he was enjoying doing and sharing his cartoons with others as it made them laugh and smile. So in case if you are thinking of your future now and don't seem to have any ideas of what to do next, just take a moment and think of what brings you pure joy. In 1917, the newspaper business failed to grow, so Elias used all his money and some of Walt's savings and brought stock in Chicago Daily Producer and moved back to the city with his family. Walt enrolled at McKinley High School and became the cartoonist of the school newspaper, drawing patriotic pictures about World War I. He also took night courses at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, but he was only allowed to take those classes if he worked at the jelly factory as a handyman and a night guard contributing to the family's income. He wasn't paid much at the factory and eventually quit to work as a gateman, mail sorter, and delivery boy. Oh my, 
At 16 years old, this kid had three jobs, school to attend, and dream he chased. It might be a little overwhelming. In mid-1918, he attempted to join the United States Army to fight the Germans, but he was rejected as too young. After forging the date of birth on his birth certificate, he joined the Red Cross in September 1918 as an ambulance driver. It was the time Plog was killing millions of people worldwide. Plog also caught the virus and was about to head to hospital when an ambulance driver warned him to go home because he would probably never walk out of that hospital. At home, his mother nursed both him and his sister days and nights, even though she also was sick. While Walt was getting better, his two close friends were infected and taken to the hospital. A little later, they passed away. To run as far as he could from this awful discovery, he went back to the Red Cross and was shipped to France. When the war was over, Walt didn't see much sense in going back to school. His father offered him a job at the factory, but for a fair salary. But Walt had already made up his mind to become an artist. So Walt packed a little he had and moved to Kansas City in 1919, where his brother Roy and a couple of friends lived already. He dreamed of working as a cartoonist for a Kansas City star, and when there were no such job openings, he applied for Copyboy instead, just to get in that building and work with likewise-minded people. But he was turned down. The same thing happened at a couple of other places. Although his brother Roy suggested finding something more practical, he was the one to tell Walt about a job at art studio, where Walt drew commercial illustrations for advertising, theater programs, and catalogs, and befriended fellow artist Up Iwerks. Their skills complemented one another. Walt was a visionary, and Up was fast and flexible. When art studio went bankrupt, two friends started their own company, Disney Iwerks. A month later, Walt was offered a position as an artist at Kansas City Film Art Service. Ab insisted Walt take that job, whereas Walt insisted his boss hire Ab after Ab failed to maintain the business alone. A cute story of two friends absolutely love it. At the studio, Walt learned a lot about animation. Do you know that they used to animate figures by cutting them into pieces? Head on one paper, body on the other? Walt was curious how was it filmed and became friends with the cameraman. Which is not as bad as it might sound since today we call it networking. Anyways, he later started to operate the camera himself and draw animations without cutouts because he thought they looked better. And while working for the company and drawing animations for its clients, he also made a little studio back home in a garage and borrowed a studio camera to film his own cartoons. Disney couldn't pursue the Kansas City Film Ad Company to try out cell animation, so he went to the manager of the Newman Theatre Company, a big thing at that time, with 300 feet of his film, which is a great amount. Of course, he impressed the manager, that agreed to feature Walt's cartoons at the theater. Walt gave his entrepreneurial career another go and founded Lafagra Films. Just like any other business, he needed to be different from others in the field, so Walt decided to produce a series of cartoons based on traditional fairy tales. He raised enough money to rent out an office, invited Ab on board, of course, and five more animators. He also signed a great deal with pictorial clubs and started to work on six cartoons. But while the team was working, pictorial clubs went bankrupt, and the company not just vanished, but also paid no penny to Walt. Walt couldn't pay his employees, couldn't rent his house or his office, and least importantly, but still, couldn't pay a cobbler for his shoes. We all have doubts in difficult times, and so did Walt. Walt cheered ourselves up and continued going, but it wasn't yet the time for Walt. He sold his camera and went to Hollywood with only $40, planning on staying with his uncle Robert and getting a job as a director in the movie company, which didn't go pretty well and when he ran out of money, he asked his brother for support. Roy advised him to go back to cartoons. Surprise! You don't expect anything like that from a person who was just so skeptical about it. So Walt created another makeshift studio in his uncle's garage now and then went around pitching his ideas instead of begging for job. Walt Disney started shopping around the Alice Wonderland film and was lucky enough to get a contract with a New York film distributor to produce six more of the short films. Disney pursued his friend Up and his brother Roy to work with him. With everything in place on October 16, 1923, Walt Disney and Roy Disney founded the Disney Brother Cartoon Studio. At Roy's suggestion, the company was soon renamed the Walt Disney Studios. And this is when the story of the Walt Disney Company really gets started. The company produced the Alice short films for the next four years. Together with the distributor of the Alice films, they created a character called Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, which didn't turn out so lucky after all. 
Disney produced 26 episodes of the Oswald cartoons in just one year. He wanted to increase the amount of money the distributor was giving for the cartoons and tried to negotiate a higher rate for the second year. But it turned out the distributor had actually gone behind Walt's back and looked for other animators, cheap animators, and spent a lot of time with Walt's employees. When Walt Disney reread his contract more closely, he found out that he didn't own the rights to his Oswald the Lucky Rabbit creation. The distributor did. So when he turned down his lower price offer, Walt lost his Lucky Rabbit and swore to always retain the rights for all of his creations. What's more, he lost his team. He was betrayed, felt awful, and was eager to outplay everyone. Feeling burned by the experience of losing Oswald, Disney decided to create a new character with up eyeworks, Mickey Mouse. The addition of sound to the film sparked a revolution, and there was no longer a market for silent films. A third film with Mickey Mouse, Steamboat Willie, was made, this time with sound. It was an instant success, and a series of Mickey Mouse cartoons was commissioned and the Mickey Mouse comic strip soon followed. If you do business, you probably know that there are always a couple of buts behind each turn success. For instance, when the cartoon was ready, first no one wanted to work with Walt, so he listened to his friend and played it in a Broadway theater, and only after that started to receive proposals for partnership. Because everyone wanted to own the rights to Mickey Mouse, Walt agreed to work with Pat Powers, one of the founders of Universal Pictures, because he didn't want to own Mickey Mouse, but agreed to distribute Walt's cartoons if he continues to use his sound system. Although it looks pretty well, Pat later betrayed Walt too. He kept hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit he made from Mickey Mouse to himself. I still cannot figure out how Walt couldn't see this coming. I mean, if you don't receive any checks, not until the sum owned is that big, how come he never realized there is something off? Well, again, that time Walt also hired an ink artist, Lillian Bounds, early 1925. And I guess things looked pretty well since they got married in July of that year. Also, Walt was probably overwhelmed by Mickey Mouse's success. It went nationwide across the US. He didn't sue Pat because he knew what a reputation and power Pat had over Hollywood, and instead simply ended their contract. There was a lot of drama anyway. Pat threatened to take down any company Walt would work with, and this kind of left Walt with the only one offer remaining, Columbia Pictures. Walt was working a lot, days and nights, together with his team on producing more and more figures, cartoons and stories. He wanted to make them higher quality, even if it meant slipping further into debt. Why he wasn't dead? Well, he wasn't receiving any money from Pat, remember? Yet, managed to maintain the whole team of artists and animators. He also thought the future was in feature-length color animated films and that they would be more popular and profitable. In 1934, he set the staff at Disney Studio to work on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, a process that would take the better part of four years. Walt Disney went all in on making the production as good as it possibly could be, and it tripled in budget. His faith paid off. Snow White premiered in 1937 with 83 minutes of the film, and it became the highest grossing film of 1938, bringing in more than $8 million in the first year alone. By 1939, it was the most successful sound film of all time. Snow White marks a real turning point for Disney. Feature films were big business, but the path ahead was about to get rocky. Actually, Columbia Pictures were no longer distributing Walt's cartoons since they refused to pay him for cartoons before he produced them, and Walt switched to United Artists. Oh, Columbia Pictures was probably thrilled about Walt's success, right? But it's okay. Sometimes you have got to switch and partner with someone you feel more confident with. Later, Walt focused on producing feature films instead of shorts. They still look amazing, by the way. But they did cost a lot to produce, driving the company on the brink of bankruptcy. This is a very important moment in Disney's history, because although Disney turned out to be right after all with his feature films, at that moment he stepped a little down, scaled them down, and took his company public. All he did to keep his company running. Do you want to know how things went from cartoons to amusement parks? Well, rumor has it, Walt was just visiting one of the parks with his daughters when he realized how dirty and old old carousels were, how bored were parents, and how sad was it all. Walt Disney had been dreaming about building an amusement park for a few years. His goal was to build an amusement park where children and parents could have fun together. The original idea was to call it Mickey Mouse Park, but this would then change to Disneyland. Roy, his brother, harbored doubts about the park idea, and so Walt set up Wet Enterprises, now known as Walt Disney Imagineering, as a new company to finance the building of the park. 
After an extensive research period when Walt was traveling around America and Europe looking for inspiration. What a lie! Researching by visiting amusement parks. Construction started on the park in July 1954, and it opened in Anaheim, California just a year later. The park consisted of a number of themed lands that branched out from a central hub – Adventureland, Frontierland, Fantasyland, and Tomorrowland. And it also had the Disneyland Hotel on the side. It was a huge success when it opened, drawing 20,000 visitors a day and 3.6 million in its first year alone. Disneyland wasn't like other amusement parks, it was something new. And so a new term was invented for it – a theme park. But yeah, it's also important to mention that Walt Disney Company wasn't dead at the time of construction, and Walt was almost begging his board of directors to go ahead with his plans to roll their movies on TV. And the first day of the Disneyland opening was a disaster. There were scammers creating counterfeit tickets, rides broke down, restaurants ran out of food, and even a gas leak was detected in one area. And I'm saying all this, so we all admit that everyone is facing problems sometimes, and it's okay. The good thing is to take notes and do something about it. That is something that later turned this disaster opening into a huge success. Sadly, on December 15, 1966, Paul Disney passed away from lung cancer at the age of 65. The man who had built an incredible empire was no more, and the model for running the company was passed to Roy Disney. Today, the Disney company is one of the world's largest media conglomerates, with such holdings as ABC, ESPN, Pixar, Marvel Entertainment, and the 20th Century Studios. The company has 220,000 employees and generates $82.7 billion in revenue. When asked about success, Walt Disney once said, This special secret, it seems to me, can be summarized in four C's. They are curiosity, confidence, courage, and constancy. And the greatest one of this is confidence. When you believe a thing, believe it all the way, implicitly and unquestionably. Keep up learning, guys. Success is just the number of attempts.